The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Just give me a moment just to check I've got everything lined up and we'll get underway. Okay. Uh, welcome to the episode number nine for the Indo-Pacific series, Aerospace, Defence and Security and Technology Market Trends. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the Executive Editor and Director for My Security Media. And we hold this series in partnership with the Aerospace and Defence Consultants Association of India. Normally, my co-host, Raman Sapori uh, from Delhi, is with us, but he could not make it this morning uh, due to other commitments. So it is just myself. And we're also joined by David Nickel, the uh, Managing Director for APJ uh, Blackberry IoT Solutions. David, thank you very much for joining us. Cheers, Chris. Thank you. Very, very good. Um, let me just do our introductions. And we're always looking for opportunities between India, Australia and the ASEAN uh, region, obviously, with our Indo-Pacific series. Our domain focus uh, today will be cities and infrastructure, uh, but we tend to cross across uh, across our domain. So we normally cover aerospace and space, defense and national security, and cybersecurity and critical technology. This one is a bit of a mix between cities and infrastructure and critical technology. These sessions are recorded. Uh, they are live on YouTube. And if you've got some questions from the audience, through everyone's just coming in now, uh, you have a chat um, tool there on the GoToWebinar platform. Uh, Moving on as we do, just to introduce our panel, we're going to be joined by our second panellist very shortly, and I'll keep an eye on him. Um, no, he's still not in, but we're joined by, uh, as I mentioned, David Nickel, Managing Director for IoT Solutions, BlackBerry, Asia Pacific and Japan. And we're going to look at the Ad Hoc Public Safety Edition, uh, Securely Communicate Critical Information. Um, and then we're also joined by, I'm just double checking, uh, Looks like someone else was coming in then, but um, Professor La Simon Lucy from the Australian Institute for Machine Learning, the AIML, uh, based in the University of Adelaide. Uh, he's going to be looking at augmented reasoning and structured interfaces between humans and machines. Simon is formerly uh, Carnegie Lemon at Mellon University uh, and has recently uh, come to Australia with the Institute and they're out of lot 14. So if we look back at our space um, episode, which was last week, bring it up. Um, we had uh, SmartSat CRC, uh, Andy Coronius there from, uh, he was also at lot 14. So it's good to have them back to back and having a look at what uh, lot 14 and these uh, South Australians are up to. Uh, episode number eight last week was a great episode with uh, Cleos Space and I mentioned uh, Andy Coronius uh, and Andrew Bauer, the CEO for Cleos Space, uh, was also with us. Just one moment. Uh, that, that is now available on our YouTube channel, obviously. And before that, episode seven, we looked at robotics and autonomous systems. Uh, I've got some a quick update on Emerson. We had Dr. Stefan uh, Hraba, the CEO for Emerson, which was a shoot off from the CSIRO uh, in terms of its drone technology. And I've got some updates on that one as well, but that is also available on our YouTube channel. Just some news from the week, just make sure everything's streaming through. We obviously had the uh, quadrilateral dialogue uh, with Japan, Australia, India, and the United States meeting in Tokyo with uh, the Australian Foreign Minister. Uh, just some updates there. That's Secretary Pompeo's Twitter feed and worth having a look. I'm trying to, going to get a wrap up next week uh, on that quad meeting and what it means. Uh, I've tried to invite some as senior people as we possibly can, but with a week to go, uh, obviously it's been a bit difficult. The Navy Task Group, the Australian Navy and uh, the Regional Presence Deployment 2020 has just concluded. This is HMAS Hobart returning uh, back into Sydney Harbour uh, on Friday. And as part of this session, we've got some defence videos. So I've put some editing together uh, and we've got um, Commander Philippa Hay from the Australian Navy who was the commander for that task group. Uh, it's about a nine minute video that I'll play at the end of this particular session. 
uh, and if you can you can stay around but otherwise it is on our YouTube channel uh, as well some reasonable footage of missiles being taken off uh, and a few others I'm not a Navy guy but uh, if you like things blowing up and uh, ships being sunk it's worth having a look uh, but thank you to uh, the Navy for that just off the press uh, about two o'clock this afternoon uh, I got an email just an update to the National Security Science and Technology Priorities for Australia these are the top six priorities, cybersecurity, intelligence, border security and identity management, investigative support and forensic science, preparedness, protect, protection, prevention and incident response and technology foresight. Not a big change there, but it's nice to see cybersecurity at the top of the pile. Uh, I believe Simon is with us. Simon, uh, you're welcome just to turn on your uh, microphone and your camera if you'd like to to log in and say hello otherwise I'll keep going nope he's okay we'll come back to, to Simon uh, sorry I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here I just unmuted myself so that, yep, I'm, I'm here and apologies for my lateness no no Simon no problems at all I, I, I have introduced you you're welcome to mute yourself grab yourself a cup of coffee and uh, David's gonna kick off for us great thank you um, I'll just finalise this. Malaysia has just released a cybersecurity strategy uh, for the next four years. Uh, I didn't get to go to the ceremony, but again, we'll revisit that. But worth noting, uh, it, I think this might be their first uh, formal strategy uh, following some recent changes. So we'll have some update on news on that. Just some tech news. Global PC ship, shipments, probably something we would all guess uh, is up 13% year on year for quarter three 2020. And that would be commensurate with everyone working from home and uh, enterprise getting out there and buying as many laptops as they can for their staff. Um, I mentioned uh, Stefan Hraba. Congratulations, Stefan. Uh, the Emerson team has now made it to the final phase for the DARPA Subterranean Challenge 2018 to 2021. Uh, that was episode. That was the last uh, sort of episode seven worth having a look at in terms of that technology. Stefan uh, walks us through uh, what they've got their drones doing, uh, their mapping technology. And as, as I mentioned, this is a uh, technology that's come out of CSIRO's Data61 Robotics and Autonomous Systems Group. So uh, congratulations to Stefan and the team. And uh, you've just heard Simon briefly there. This is on the back of a 20 million boost for AI research. And uh, this is out of the University of Adelaide. So we're gonna hear from Simon based on this particular uh, uh, media release uh, and a new $20 million to spend there with the South Australian government and lot 14. And just to briefly introduce uh, why David has, has uh, been able to join us today, BlackBerry has announced the integration of its ad hoc with the Microsoft Teams uh, critical uh, for a critical event management. So we'll hear more about that. And finally, David, we were talking before about other platforms and we forgot we didn't actually mention Microsoft Teams. So uh, it's good. We'll hear more about that. And uh, this is not the first time we've had David on our channels. Uh, if you look back at episode 168 of our pod podcast series, August 2019, uh, we looked at the uh, BlackBerry Intelligent Security and Adaptive Security and Artificial Intelligence. And I threw that up because obviously we're going to be looking at machine learning and AI today also. So hopefully uh, we'll get the link in the show notes for that particular episode. Um, just on the marketplace, uh, our latest, latest podcast came out this week, uh, last Friday. I interviewed Hai Tran, the Chief Executive Officer for the Australian Cyber Collaboration Center, and uh, Mohan Ku, the CTO and co-founder for DTEC Systems, just on their collaboration and again, uh, Hi Tran was the former CISO for WA Police, but now based in Adelaide, uh, in and around Lot 14. So again, part of this um, real push uh, in South Australia for collaboration. And we now have all of our podcasts on the marketplace so you can access directly uh, on that particular platform. Malaysia, I mentioned their Malaysian cybersecurity strategy. Closing next Friday, we have the top women in security in Malaysia. So we've we've got a reasonable amount of nominations and we're into a final push for that. So if you know any uh, ladies in Malaysia in the industry, please reach out to them and get them to either reach out to their local chapters of ISACA or ASIS or the Malaysian Women in Security or email us here at My Security Media and we'll get you that link. Uh, otherwise, it's on our ASEAN TechSec channel. 
Uh, 3D Printing World in India, 6th edition, 5th and 6th of December. Raman would normally have spoken more about that one, but uh, that's approaching quickly. And for any other events, I won't spend too much time on this. This is this week's events that are on the marketplace. Uh, shout out to Gav Schneider, Protective Security and Government Conference uh, there. It's a virtual event normally held in Canberra. And Identity Week is also on uh, this week. Um, normally based in Singapore and net events also uh, new cloud Edge ST WAN and their 5G and SACE uh, forums they're worth following also next week uh, shout out to Shemang Tan on the writing the digital skies for the Privacec conference I think the Australian Security Awards has been postponed this particular year but I think nominations still might be able to be made and the Hanover Mess, the Industrial Transformation Asia Pacific 2020 is one to look out for also next week as a reasonably sized uh, event. And there's one in there in Dubai. Some recent reports, I mentioned DTEC Systems uh, podcast uh, released this week. This is their remote and risk report inside a threat report uh, and a few others there on the marketplace in terms of reports and white papers. So that's enough from me and our introduction. I'm going to hand over to David Nickel now, and David uh, introduces us to the BlackBerry ad hoc. And uh, mate, I've got two links here for you. So I might let's go with one. Have you logged in a couple of times? Didn't intend to. Okay. Uh, but I did see my uh, my ghost appear um, <laughs> okay, a few minutes yes. ago. I'm, hopefully, you find the right person. Okay. So look, let me let me try one. And uh, and then hopefully that should work. Okay, one second. Oh, good. Do you get your prompt? Uh, not yet. No, maybe it's. Okay. What I'll do maybe is I'll try that again. Uh, how about now? There we go. That's it. Great. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. So just as a, a bit of an intro to the audience, we're going to talk about secure and critical communications uh, for cities. Um, and I guess to start with, what do we mean by um, secure critical communications? And that's really anything, you know, communications that any organization needs to make uh, during a critical incident that could impact people's safety or business continuity. Um, and there's a wide spectrum of, of those events. They could be uh, natural disaster uh, events, floods, fires, etc. They could be man-made events, terrorist activities, um, uh, suspicious packages, uh, could be IT related events, including uh, cybersecurity events or other system outages. Uh, and more recently, we'd be familiar with a incident that's now spanned, you know, six months or more, and that is um, pandemics. And, and there is increased recognition of the importance of timely and consistent communication uh, to improve the response from a range of organisations relating to uh, to those events. Uh, and today I'm just going to touch on some of the technologies that um, that are available today and that are emerging to assist uh, assist with that with that task. Um, now, uh, you may be familiar with mass notification systems. You may have some in place within your organization today uh, that would send an SMS or or an email when an event occurs. But in the last really few years, there's been significant development in, in technology that enables a range of other capabilities. Uh, the first one you'll see as you move to the right is, is incident management. So historically, um, or many organizations have managed manual documents for their uh, incident response plans. Um, the opportunity to digitize and to automate that to assist responders, but also to provide a, an auditable and trackable uh, mechanism for those um, for those incidents. 
and incorporating as some of the steps in those plans being those, uh, those mass notifications that we'll touch on a little bit more. Um, I'm going to talk uh, in a little while about the importance of inter-organisation collaboration, really recognising that no incident uh, happens in isolation. It's not just police or fire responding, it's not just one organisation responding to an incident, but typically there's a number of organisations involved and improving the, again, the timeliness and the reliability of communications between those organisations can make a significant difference. Um, predictive automation, so we're talking about um, AI uh, a little bit later today, but uh, you know, technology is emerging where there are there's a number of data inputs relating to events as they unfold and how can you leverage remote sensors, IoT devices um, that I'll touch on to help predict uh, or provide early warning relating to, uh, to uh, an event. I know in Australia, it's something that we're uh, grappling with and you know, if you can detect, for example, fires within an hour um, then the the outcome relating to the severity of that fire is far different than if it takes you uh, 24 hours to to identify that that fire. Um, real time collaboration, so uh, you know, very important in responding to an incident in in a city or a community is to have an incident response team. How can that team collaborate with each other to share intelligence and enhance the uh, the response. Uh, and then we get machine learning and predictive analysis. How do you take the inputs from those remote sensors and uh, improve um, the situational awareness relating to, to incidents? So, so one of the sort of three topics I want to touch on today is the importance of what we call multimodal communication. So when an incident occurs, the importance of not just using one channel to deliver communications. Um, you'll see here some media reports from the fires earlier this year in, in Australia, where despite us having, through independent research, you know, the best mobile network in, in the world, um, fires have a significant impact to that infrastructure that can prevent messages being delivered. Uh, and I guess there's increased recognition that a resilient single network, you know, even if you um, improve the redundancy of those towers, for example, still represents a single point of failure. And if you can't deliver a message to an employee or a citizen who is potentially impacted, um, could have a, 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 di a dire outcome. Um, and there's a range of capabilities available, right? And if you look through these devices, none of these devices are new. I guess what is um, what has emerged is the capability to deliver a consistent message across all of these modes to ensure that delivers are getting uh, that messages are getting uh, through. Uh, not only to provide redundancy, but also recognizing that different portions of the community uh, will um, respond differently to um, uh, to different media. Some people are more comfortable with uh, receiving messages on social media, for example. Uh, SMS is ubiquitous, but uh, has some of those challenges I just mentioned uh, in in uh, mobile networks. Radio can be effective. Um, you know, one uh, project that. BlackBerry has been involved in, in Mexico, is deploying fixed frequency radios to regional and rural areas, um, powered through both battery and, and, uh, and power through, for redundancy. But So when an incident occurs or, or an earthquake occurs, uh, those citizens can be alerted through those uh, radios, even if the mobile network uh, is, is not up digital signage or, or messages through TV screens, uh, mobile applications, which can provide richer content as well as be able to um, uh, access multiple data networks to get that, that message. 
uh, public sirens, whether they're IP connected or non-IP uh, connected to deliver um, text to speech uh, into community areas, um, desktop pop-up. Uh, so we work with a number of organizations, including defense organizations where having a mobile device in their place of work is not a possibility. And our research suggests that a invasive pop-up on a desktop can be the most effective uh, way of, of getting a response. Traditional phone lines, we've had debates in Australia about with the rollout of the NBN, do we maintain our copper network? Uh, and there is an argument around crisis communications that, that you do because if, again, if the mobile network is not down, can you make a, a call, uh, an automated call to uh, home phones um, to, um, to deliver that message? Email is an obvious one. Um, uh, radio networks uh, and and the list goes uh, goes on. But one thing is is important is that all those messages come from a single source that is uh, that is consistent and where possible, where supported by that device, is two way so that you can have a mechanism of accountability, <clears throat> not just uh, mass communications, uh, so that you can confirm the safety of an employee or uh, or a citizen. And one of the, I guess, um, best approaches to ensure that consistency is pre-prepared templates. You know, you don't want um, a an operator when sending an alert uh, to be creating a message on the fly, determining who it should go to. Most of that, 90% of that should be pre-prepared so that when the incident occurs, the message can be delivered uh, quickly. Uh, and what is also predefined is, is what are the devices that message is sent to that is relevant for that incident and for that, uh, that audience. Um, a related conversation is around secure communications for incident response. Um, so the discussion here is if you have a major incident, let's call it um, uh, a fire event, and you've got um, a set of incident responders, let's say police and fire, uh, collaborating uh, around an incident, the, the security uh, and reliability of that communication is, is paramount. And the reality is there are risks associated with traditional uh, voice or mobile uh, telephony that you'll see um, here, either through interception uh, or through identity hacking and, and spoofing, potentially resulting in sharing misleading information relating to, um, to an incident. Uh, and the reality is that there is technology available, in this case, um, BlackBerry SecuSuite um, uh, platform that is certified and can fully encrypt calls and messages from standard smartphones. So you don't need a separate uh, device. So, you know, ideal for BYO, uh, even for, um, uh, for volunteer responders. Uh, and it's a closed network. So uh, you can't have anyone um, uh, participating or, or uh, spoofing into a conversation um, uh, through a public, uh, public network. David, is that that's an app-based mm. uh, aspect on the device? So you, you open Correct, up that app, so right. you don't need to have it on. It's in case of an emergency, you can flip over to encrypted messages and the like. Correct, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so it's it's a mobile app for iOS or or Android, um, and uh, and those communications go via a server which encrypts encrypts both ends. It can break out into a public network or to a PBX network so that at least the at risk portion of a communication from the person who is mobile uh, back to headquarters, for example, um, is, uh, is encrypted. Um, and because it can use any data network, whether it's cellular or Wi-Fi, um, we'll often have a better uh, chance of, of connecting in a, uh, in, a, um, in a critical incident it's easy to access and use. Again, you don't need a separate uh, device. It looks like a normal uh, dialer, but it also gives you all the record retention and reporting. So if there's um, uh, you know, analysis done post 
uh, event, you've got records of who called who, when, and, and messages that were sent, etc. Yeah, I mean, I can. There's a thousand questions I've got with with that. Mm. How granular control have you got? Because you might have staff that have left, but they might have that application still on their phone. So, yeah, how much real time granular control do you have across this? I imagine quite a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, down to the um, yeah, certainly down to the user and the device level. So every call or message that is initiated will authenticate the user and you can combine that with biometrics from the device uh, as well as um, uh, authenticate the device. So when you, uh, when you deploy the application, um, uh, you're doing so with a, a specific device. So if a user leaves and wants to deploy it on a, on a new device, they, they, can't, uh, they can't do that. Um, it's also, you know, you can put this in the hands of of uh, citizens who you know may need to have um, uh, confidential conversations with uh, with government employees, um, you know use cases for deployed government staff, whether it's defence or or foreign affairs staff who, mm. who need to even just to call home or call back to um, uh, back to their um, central office when um, when an incident is uh, is is occurring. Okay, I could see uh, applications saying even domestic violence situations uh, to get messages out to certain people as well. Very good. Okay, right, sorry yeah, interrupt. The whole, whole range of he says, no, no, all good. Please go ahead. So I just want to, I guess, the next topic I want to touch on is just the growing consideration around duty of care and business continuity from a range of organisations, and this is w really where the city's concept comes up and what BlackBerry calls um, a shield, right? How do you establish a network of, of communications between a range of organizations during an incident to effectively provide protection for the whole community? Because I as I mentioned before, no incident happens in isolation and typically doesn't just affect one organization, nor can you just rely on emergency responders to provide uh, all of the support relating to uh, to an incident. Um, employers play a role around duty of care, whether those employees are in the office or increasingly, as we know, uh, working from, from home. Educational institutions, so Macquarie University, who use our technology, um, you know, being able to alert all students and staff uh, when an incident occurs on campus healthcare providers to uh, to their staff and a lot of use cases around COVID there relating to, um, you'll see a couple of examples here like uh, health surveys or um, policies and procedures is a common one. How do you communicate with your frontline staff when you've changed policies and procedures and with two-way communication so they can acknowledge the acceptance and, and that they've read those uh, terms and conditions. Um, local government uh, obviously play uh, a role, utilities and other um, critical infrastructure. Um, and, you know, just good to think in, in the context of your organisation where some of these use cases are relevant, because it's not just about incident alerting when there's a fire or a flood or whatever it might be, right? It's coordination of your response teams, policies and procedures, as I mentioned, maybe just logistics around key events where um, running that event effectively uh, will have an impact on positively on people's safety and business continuity, uh, travel updates, um, again, health surveys, examples of organisations sending surveys periodically to uh, to staff to confirm that they are healthy and not showing any uh, any symptoms and providing support through through that um, location and situational uh, awareness they'll touch on in a little bit how do you in, ensure you're getting full visibility of, of incidents as they unfold um, alternative work uh, arrangements you know very relevant with COVID if you're starting to get staff back into uh, the office, how do you communicate that so that it's, it's streamlined and you're not putting staff at risk. Um, and then staff recall, um, again, common in uh, healthcare, you've got 
nurses that may have called in sick, but you uh, you need to identify replacements that have the right skills um, that that are appropriate to fill that shift. How do you do that with a very targeted communication strategy rather than sending an alert to to all of your nurses as as an example? David, what's the business model for that? Because I imagine you, there's a lot of use of mm. use cases there. Is it based on the number of users? Hopefully, it's not based on how many messages you send out because you you won't get that functionality. Yeah. But yeah, what's the how, what's the business model? Yeah, good question. Yes, it's it's largely based on on number of users and then you know the the level of of capability you want to provide. But the main one is is the number of of users. Uh, one area that we have chosen to differentiate from other providers in in the market is uh, because there is a cost associated with some traditional delivery methods like SMS and to a certain extent email. Um, you know, we ask customers to estimate you know the number of SMS messages they will send, and we establish a, a fix an agreed fixed cost on that for an annual term. Uh, and, and what that means is effectively we take some risk that if the customer needs to send more alerts because they're having more incidents, um, they can do so uh, and, and it doesn't um, blow their budget or there shouldn't be any hesitation for an organisation to test their system or to send an alert when an incident, uh, when an incident occurs. Yep, nice. Um, and then, Chris, you mentioned that the public safety uh, addition of, of our BlackBerry ad hoc, and, and this is really how do you get messages to, uh, to the public, whether that's at a, a federal, state or local level, um, how can you deliver messages effectively to your citizens, but also to, uh, uh, to relevant uh, other constituents, whether they're um, commercial organisations in the region, other government bodies, critical infrastructure, manufacturing facilities, uh, etc. Um, and this is, you know, a platform that is fast and simple to deploy, cloud-based, deployed in, you know, 48 hours. We've had customers with all their users integrated into the system and, and sending uh, messages it's easy to manage. You don't necessarily, you know, you don't need a, a dedicated security team or operations team. You can initiate an alert from the mobile application um, uh, for someone who has the, the relevant authority to do that. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, it's it's uh, it's uh, fixed cost. Um, and and to the discussion earlier, it leverages multiple channels. So as a starting point, it's SMS, email or, or mobile applications, but then you can extend that to other public devices, whether it's sirens or, or PA systems or digital signage, etc. cetera. Um, and it includes all the compliance that you may need, whether you're a local government organization uh, or a commercial organization to track and monitor those alerts dashboards on who's responded, um, how many people you've you've reached from your database, uh, but then end-to-end -end audit logs. So if you need to submit post event for any, um, uh, for any inspections that are performed on, on that incident response, uh, or even just to improve, uh, improve best practices. Um, and then finally, uh, I wanted to touch on the situational awareness piece, right? So, you know, on the right hand side is, you know, all the or some of the ways you can deliver messages in the middle is, you know, the IT system in, in our case, ad hoc that you would use to um, to formulate your um, your templates to determine who you're going to send messages to over what uh, over what method capture all the dashboarding, etc. But then the other question that a number of organizations are looking at is how do I get inputs into the system that gives me insight into the, the incident that's occurring, either so I know about it faster or I'm getting more information relating to that, that incident, right? Uh, and just some examples there. So um, you'll see mobile alerts there. So not only can the mobile app provide rich, richer content 
than an SMS would, like include a, a map or a link for additional information. Um, but you can have employees or even citizens as sensors effectively, uh, being able to capture photo and geolocation of an incident as it occurs and based on the type of what we call a field report that they complete, it can then be automatically sent to the right team to respond. So if it was an office location and it was a suspicious package and an employee saw it, they choose suspicious package from a pull down menu, they take a photo, it's geotagged and you can have the system set up so that's sent directly to security or the security person uh, on um, on call, just as, as one uh, simple example. Uh, but there's a range of others, right? So access control so that you can know who is in the building uh, to send an alert to or to involve in an accountability exercise rather than have people downstairs from the office, you know, ticking a, um, uh, ticking a, a sheet and not really knowing, you know, who was in the office uh, to start with. Um, inputs from fire alarm systems, weather warning systems, push buttons in in high risk areas, whether that's uh, manufacturing uh, facilities or even in um, in communities where people may be at risk and and uh, and need uh, need assistance. Um, touch on a couple of others. Uh, you know, in more of a a defence context, um, we r fairly recently announced a partnership with a company called D Drone. Uh, that does drone detection. Uh, so it's great if you can detect that there's, there's a drone over your airport or over your military base, but how do you alert the relevant people relating to the, um, the presence of that drone? So that input comes from the drone to the ad hoc system and, the, and then uh, we'll, um, we'll, uh, can automatically send an alert. Um, partnering with another organization around injury detection. So for police or military, um, you know, a small sheath under the uh, under their clothing can detect if if they've been stabbed or shot. And again, uh, getting that that input from that IoT device into yeah. to ad hoc that, to then send uh, alerts to relevant uh, to relevant people. Could I just um, come back to so that? Just the, on, sort of, yeah, go for sorry, it. just on the business yeah. model for those, do you get access like from a user base to the platform, and then you can deploy it in all of those ways, or are you buying layers of the platform as as it kind of goes because i imagine this could be a really good on mm. sort of on demand model where the organization just starts to deploy it i work a lot with cities uh i'm thinking yes. graffiti management you know uh right. even general incidents in the city matching with cctv uh camera locations and the like uh you know matching an incident mm. report to a location there's no end yes. of scenarios um just from the user base, so how do you kind of sell this to clients to go, you yeah. subscribe to the platform and then you use it yes. or you have to know how you're going to use it first? Yeah, well, um, let me describe a, a typical deployment. Most customers would start with the alerting and the accountability capability. So how do they get messages to employees or citizens quickly uh, and how do they get a response and capture that uh, in the console um, to determine people's uh, safety uh, and to do that over those typical delivery models of SMS, email and, and the mobile application. Uh, so that's, that's the sort of the, the core um, uh, starting point. The extension from that is, um, uh, is the collect, uh, what we call collect, which is having in the hands of the uh, of the end user, a um, the capability to send a, a field report or to send a duress if they're in uh, if they're in trouble. Now, um, so that's a um, you know an additional license for that capability. But for many organisations, they might have a thousand employees, but maybe fifty people need that capability. Maybe it's their security staff or their staff that are regularly mobile and in at risk. Uh, at risk situations, so it's it's very modular, easy to add mm -hmm. those additional um, those additional uh, capabilities. Um, but typically, yeah, that alert and account piece, as well as the planning piece and the ability to connect with other organisations, would be you know additional um, 
phases that people would uh, would uh, deploy, but off and would would be included in uh, in the, the platform yeah, that so they, it's modular they acquire as well. up front. Yeah, modular is probably a good description. Yes, okay. yes, absolutely. Fair enough. Yeah, no, that's right. But it also surprises many organisations, many government or commercial organisations. You know what the solution starts from, and we we are yeah. talking sort of tens of cents per per user per month, right? You know, it's it's it, it is. A really cost-effective way. If you don't have something in place today, or, or if you're just using SMS and paying on a uh, on a per message basis, and it's not fit for purpose, you know this is not a you know a significant um, investment to, to provide that people safety and, and business continuity. Fair enough. Okay. Um, um, you, yeah, that's that it from summary? from me. Okay. Well, yeah. I don't have any questions from the audience, and I annoyed you enough with a few other questions. I think the, the key one for me would be that single source. So there's managing that misinformation, yes. but you've got, I'd imagine you'd say, okay, well, we've got BlackBerry silence from a cybersecurity context as well. Um, so BlackBerry, you know, you're in a, obviously uh, several businesses, uh, but communication is always critical. Uh, so look, stay on with us if you can, David, you're very welcome to. Uh, and Thank uh, you. Given that you're out touching on the machine learning, I've no doubt you'll have some interest in, in Simon as well. Uh, Simon, just double checking if you can come on and join us. I'll bring us back uh, to screen. I, yep, I'm, I'm, I'm on, but unfortunately, for whatever reason, I'm on a Mac and the oh. camera's not working. So okay. I can, I've got the audio and I can share my screen. Um, so we might just have to go with Oh, hang on. Maybe something's popped Yeah, up. I just prompted you to oh. see if that actually works. Max just okay. do not like GoToWebinar for some reason. Yeah, no, I'm running the same same thing. So, okay. yeah. I'm, yeah, but I've, I've included a picture of myself, which is probably better than the than, than reality in the presentation. So, so do you want me to try and, with that. and hand over to you? Let's give it a crack. Okay. Okay, um, saying, uh, apologies to everyone on this, saying That's something it. about giving me permissions or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah the MacBooks don't like um, the, yeah. must be it's some saying, sort of sense. Do you want to maybe just email me through a presentation? Yeah, I can do that. Um, that. It wants me to quit and come back in. That's the thing it's asking me to do. Go on it wants then. To present. See how you go. Okay. All right. Give me, give me, give me five seconds, and I'll do do give that. Give it a crack, and uh, we'll tap dance okay. while we're here. <laughs> I'm tempted to play the video, which will give us nine minutes, but that might be even too long. Uh, let's see how he goes. Uh, I'll bring back control. Nice. So thank you for your patience, I'm back ladies in. and gentlemen. Uh, yep, thank you. How did yep. you go? Should I'll, be so. I think, I'll think if you send you. it to me again to try yeah, to do it. Let's yep. Give it a go. No, I might have to send you my presentation. Oh, gosh. All right. Um. <laughs> Look, do that. And what I'm going to do, because I had a video that we were going to play at the end of the session, but just fire me through that okay. email. If you don't okay. mind, that's All okay. Right. Yep, yep. No, no problem. I'm just going to send you the PDF version of it. So yeah, it's, that's it's fine. There. But um, I can, I can, I can talk to everyone just about sort of Go roughly on then. Of course. What, it, what it is I do <laughs> and um, and um, what the what what all the hubrub hubrub has been about the augmented um, augmented reasoning center. So um, I'm sending it through now to thank um, you. So basically, my name's. Um, Simon Lucy, I'm the new director of the Australian Institute of Machine Learning. Um, I've come from a place called Carnegie Mellon University, who, uh, for those of you who are sort of 
aware of AI and ML. It's a pretty well-known place um, where they, they, they do a lot of work in that, in that space. Um, my expertise in particular is in, in a part of AI called computer vision or machine perception. Um, and so, yeah, so basically, and um, as many of you may or may not know, University of Adelaide is actually um, very highly ranked in that space. And so um, it's sort of a real pleasure to come join them and to sort of add to all, all the great people that are already there. Um, and so I've also coming from industry as well. So I've been working for the last three years for an auto autonomous car startup called Argo AI. And I had some neat videos that I was going to share with you guys about Argo AI. Um, the, uh, in particular, I was doing a lot of stuff on perception um, and the perceptual parts of the, um, so I'm trying to do two things, two things at, <laughs> at the same time. Um, the um, perceptual parts of the autonomous car stack and, and set up. So um, doing a lot of sort of a lot of a lot of stuff, actually. So working at sort of stuff that's actually physically going to go into the car, blue sky research and in between. And what's also really interesting, too, is I was operating in a joint academic industry model, which I think is a bit new to Australia. So basically, I had joint appointments at both in industry and in the university. And um, that is increasingly happening more and more in the states. In fact, in AI, it's very rare to come across an AI professor that doesn't have mm. a joint appointment now. Um, and so, um, and that's something that's slowly starting to seep in um, here to um, the, U the US. Um, the Yeah, and so basically, um, I've come in at a very, very opportune time. Um, I, I guess sort of, um, one of the reasons I've been asked to come and speak is that um, in the latest federal budget, um, we got earmarked for um, funding of a brand new center in something called um, augmented reasoning, which is, um, it's it's difficult enough to say, perhaps more difficult to understand, but actually it's, it's, a, it's a simple concept. Um, the concept centers around um, how current AI is learning. So I think people are getting very, very excited by AI, AI at the moment. Um, but they're getting excited because the machines and devices and drones and what have you are starting to exhibit more and more human-like behavior. They're, like, say, you've got autonomous cars that are sort of um, driving. You've got um, um, you've got UAVs that are able to kind of track people. You're able to kind of put your phone up and reconstruct um, different worlds. You can have pretend chats to your speaker. Um, so people are sort of increasingly amazed at these sort of human-like qualities we can instill on machines. But one of the big issues is we're actually coming up against an AI brick wall pretty rapidly. And one of the reasons is because machines don't learn like people. They exhibit human-like behavior, but they don't learn like people. And sort of a classic example is with autonomous cars. Um, autonomous cars are uh, getting very close. They have these different, I don't know if your listeners are aware of the different levels of autonomy in autonomous cars, but the big thing everyone's going for is like level five. And level five is sort of where you can remove the steering wheel and the cars can just drive by themselves. And um, there's the race is on. It's almost like a, it's almost like a, um, um, the, the moon race. You've got different companies in different countries pushing very, very hard in it. We're about um, level 3.5 at the moment, Simon, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So right about that. So if, if any of your listeners have like driven in a Tesla, you know that you can probably kind of like turn the auto the auto drive on. And people have done some crazy things. They've driven from one end of the US to the other end of the US and, and, and sort of done these types of things. But um, so, but that level five is, and I think companies will get there. So I'm not sort of pessimistic about about that. But the broader outlook for AI, AI is um, um, not darker, but cloudier in the sense that the way that we've been training AI systems to date un is not like how we humans um, learn. And, and the example I like to give is sort of like, if you get a 16 year old learning how to drive, they don't need to drive 5 million miles to be a, a, to be a competent driver. They, they only need, I think here in South Australia, you only need 75 hours worth of driving time and you're, you're ready to go for your, your provisionals. Um, you cannot train an AI to do anything like that. And that sort of insight sort of transcends to many, many problems in AI. So to basically kind of in a, to get it in a nutshell, the Augmented Reasoning Center is essentially trying to get machines to learn like we do, learn with way less examples and to learn in a much more intuitive way. 
And so we can, um, and what's really exciting about that is that it'll open up AI for uses in much more mainstream society and businesses. Because at the moment, a lot of AI is in the realms of sort of the big multinationals, people who, who have the money to train AI in the way it needs to be trained, which is very, very inefficient and, and, and inexpensive. But um, a big kind of hope and goal for the Augmented Reasoning Center, and we're really proud to be hosting it um, here in Adelaide at the Australian Institute of Machine Learning, is to put forward or unlock some of these sort of fundamental barriers blocking AI at the moment from sort of making this next jump. And, um, and, and what's also kind of really exciting by it too is it's strategic for Australia. Um, we don't have a big population um, we don't have the big multinationals, but what we have is an excellent education system with lots of really smart people. And so if we can kind of like strategically invest in places where Australia can get the biggest bang for its buck out of AI, it's sort of a win-win for everyone. And so in a nutshell, and apologies for the lack of my face and the lack of my <laughs> media, I've got a picture of but, you up. That's um, yep. as best as we can do. So. <laughs> Um, but we can kind of put up with, and, and if you maybe have me back at some point, um, I can, you, um, we can. You owe we can... me an episode, Simon, you're doing very well just on audio alone. And I'm a bit disappointed we okay. don't have a presentation. I can add the videos on no. to this session, but keep yeah, going with yeah, the session yeah, for anyway. Sure. For sure. And so, um, and so it's, it's, a uh, so, so basically that's some of the insight behind, behind the augmented reasoning center. Um, and. I guess the other thing that's exciting about the Augmented Reasoning Centre too is I think you hear a lot nowadays about what AI can do and um, and and sometimes it's very doomsday-ish. People get very, very fearful about people losing jobs, um, people kind of um, it, it, it upheaving governments, um, people getting nervous about it. And one thing I'm excited about with the Augmented Reasoning Centre and, and sort of the, the, the track that AI is having in Australia in general is we're really trying to kind of look at look at the massive positives of the society in the world that can stem from AI. And um, I think part of that is AI is essentially going to be is a job multiplier. Um, so I, I've come from um, a city called Pittsburgh. Um, for those of you who are aware of the US, it's traditionally been viewed as a steel town, it was sort of economically depressed during the 70s because of sort of the, the the rust belt and the hollowing out of the of the middle class in those in those rust belt rust belt stakes in the US, but it has had some, somewhat of a, res, a a resurgence, and a lot of that is due to this unique link between that's been built up between the university sector and industry, and um, in particular in the AI sector, one of the barriers to sort of success in AI is access to talent. So like like talent like PhD talent in particular. And so what's happening increasingly in Pittsburgh and um, is that these big multinationals, they're setting up labs right next to these top tier universities and um, that are top in global rankings. And so what's sort of a, 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 a hidden secret here in Australia is how well ranked and the number of great people that are here at University of Adelaide um, in particular, but in, in Australia as well. And we're sort of, there's a real opportunity here for job growth as well. So, um, um, and what's great is that when these knowledge jobs comes in, come in, it's not just one job. The the job multipliers. There are so many flow on effects that come um, that could be very very beneficial to the uh, to, to the to the to the general state and Australia itself. But sorry, I cut you off. No, I was going to say, how long have you been in Adelaide now at Lot Fourteen? Um, so I started last month. Oh, okay. um, so yes, yes. So I, it's a very, very new new gig, but I have been interacting with University of Adelaide for a number of years, and um, we, we 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 try to hire students from there when I was in the states, and actually it's what attracted me back because I was sort of curious of whether I could be in sort of a a top tier research institution as well as be in Australia, and, and sort of the, the 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 dream has happened for me, and I've been able to come back home, and um, very excited to to be taking a leadership role in, in what seems to be sort of a, a rapidly expanding domain. Well, look, we've just, I mentioned just in our introduction last week, we had the SmartSat CRC, Professor Coronia CEO on. Uh, he's based in Lot 14. And then on uh, Monday, we released a podcast with the Australian Cyber Collaboration Centre, also there in Lot 14. So I think once you get your feet on the ground there, you'll realise that that's really a a central point and uh, I'm hearing a lot of Adelaide uh, in what they're doing so it's very interesting I think um, in terms of questions I've kind of got 
three here, and we might finalise it on that. Uh, yeah. I don't know which one to go first. In terms of, you mentioned computer vision. You've done a lot of work in computer vision. Yes. Uh, maybe, what have you seen around AI learning in virtual environments, in that sort of vision environment? And I understand cars are learning to drive on virtual roads. Yes. Yeah. So I can I can comment about that. So um, so in a way, that is one strategy that some of the AI community is trying to go down because of the inability of current AI to learn like we do. So um, what it has to be done, it's almost like um, um, a lookup table. It needs to be exposed to every possible situation it could ever encounter. And so um, if it's encountered enough situations, it can safely navigate it. And unfortunately, um, there are what we sometimes call tail events, events that are statistically very, very unlikely. And so if you were to just sort of get a car and drive it around a city for like a year, you may, you may kind of get regular types of um, situations like people turning left and giving way and doing things, but you may rarely run into a situation of a small child running across a busy street, okay? Um, but that's the situation that we really want the car to stop on. We really want it to recognize that event. And so one way to do that is to sort of create virtual worlds where sort of these rare events become much more common and the machines then can actually be trained up to recognize them because they're super important. Um, there's a drawback to this strategy, but, and um, it, it comes from, it, it goes across different names, but there's something called a render gap and so the render gap is this, is that oftentimes when you look at these virtual worlds, you can tell it's not real. Mm. Even though it's very faithfully realistic, you can tell it's a fake image. Um, so one of the things is because we don't know really how neural networks learn, we're not really sure what they're picking up on. So in the end of the day, you still need to evaluate these autonomous vehicles in the real world so you can have some trust in what they're doing. And therein sort of lies a rub. Um, and, so, and so kind of it, it is one strategy and there's a lot of work there's startup companies now and a lot of people investing in that but at the end of the day um it is a good solution it's a possible solution but it's not going to solve everything because whether it's a, an autonomous car or an autonomous um plane or a uav or any type of application you need to have some sort of trust in how it's going to behave in the real world and nothing can really replace that real world interaction um, but, okay. but that being said, yeah. um, they're, they're getting better and better. The renderings are getting better and better. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting strategy. Well, I'm, I'm just thinking through how you're approaching uh, the problem of you know, creating a, a reasoning learning plat platform for AI, whether you're dealing with particular problems and it's a bit of a trial and error, or you're looking at a, a platform almost like what we were just looking at with uh, sort of ad hoc where you have a platform and then you can almost use it in so many different ways in a sort of a modular approach. Um, yeah, where, where, is it back, obviously research-based? That's what most of that work is involved yes. in? Yes, so, so it's funny. I, I kind of joke to my PhD students. I believe a lot of research for AI starts on the whiteboard, not the keyboard. Mm. And so it's a sort of a saying I like sort of throwing around. And so it, it is sort of more fundamental and grassroots. Um, the one that when I think of the, the reasoning problem, like one example I like coming back to is um, is adding or multiplying. So you'd be sort of like surprised. It's actually pretty hard for a neural network to do a good job of learning adding and multiplication, especially with images. So like if you show a bunch of images of say 396 plus 542, um, if you show a neural network every possible combination of add and multiply, it can memorize it and do a good job. But say, again, you have to show it every possible combination. Whereas sort of if you show a human sort of just a few examples or like not, not every example, we can kind of generate the algorithm automatically for what addition is and then apply it in a more general sense. Yeah. And sort of that's really what reasoning is about. So the difference, difference between reasoning and learning is that reasoning can sort of go outside what it's been shown. Whereas sort of learning tends to stay within its confines. And so that's the, um, and I don't want to get too mathy for your listeners, but that's basically the the nugget there that we're trying to kind of push on. Can we can we get more human-like learning going on in these machines? That was my next question. I haven't looked at your background in too much detail, but are you a mathematician, a data scientist, or a computer scientist? What's your your base? 
Um, so it's funny. Um, I came through, um, when I came through, I came through with an engineering degree. I did a bachelor of electronic, um, and electrical engineering. Um, my PhD was in computer science. Um, but I do kind of gravitate. I do believe that good solutions to AI start with what we call sort of a mathematical objective, like sort of solving something. And then sort of the algorithms naturally tease out of that. So it's, it is a sort of a philosophic, um, philosophical approach to the, to the, to the, to the, to the technique. Um, yeah. So I am a bit mathy, but I like working on problems that have impact. So I don't like sort of like working on them in isolation. So I like to see it used in an autonomous car or used in practical applications. Um, but, but I do believe too, that um, in a way, I think we're in a unique time for AI. Um, in some ways, I kind of think back to the to the previous centuries, so like when Samuel Morse invented the Morse code. Um, people sort of um, were making lots of money because they were setting up companies. Um, they realized that they could send signals backwards and forwards, but no one had any clue about how far you could send a signal, how much information you could send. And we needed someone like um, 50 years later, like Claude Shannon, to come along and kind of invent information theory. Um, I, I feel we're kind of in this sort of this Morse code age of AI. We can make money from it. It's awesome. We're really, really excited by it. But many, very little people have a good understanding of what's really going on. And so, um, and that's and that's where the science gets exciting. All right, you're definitely coming back. Final question: uh, Will we reach the point of singularity? <laughs> <laughs> We we may have we may have already in this <laughs> entire conversation special. Um, no, um, <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I think that it 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 it, it depends. Um, um, and also, it's sort of I, I do believe that 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 sort of buys into sort of the doomsdayish view of AI. Um, I I believe that sort of to, just to answer your question in a broader sense and sort of like sort of to take the sort of oh well is there a sort of an AI Armageddon coming or are we going to be, be yeah we're going to be um, reaching the singularity um, I, I I think that um, it's it's like anything it's the it's Pandora's box is open it's mm. not going away but the thing is is that um, it's incumbent upon well functioning de democratic societies to have a seat at the AI table and to be contributing into making contrib contributions because that's the only way that we're going to be listened to and to have a voice at the table. And so I feel very strongly that sort of, um, we need good ethics, we need good governance, but we need to be doing fundamental work here in Australia so we can have a seat at that table and be able to kind of um, um, have a choice in our kids' futures and how AI is going to be used, not only in the economy and, and in defense, but in society in general. And so I, I think it's an, an important thing to think about, but my outlook's very positive. It's, it's glass half full. So I, I've skipped your question, but no, I'm very no, positive no. About, about AI. <clears throat> no, uh, look, I've done a lot of interviews uh, in AI and um, yeah, some are calling it within five years, but who knows? And I know I noticed you touched on or well, mentioned ethics as well, and that's uh, always a good one. Uh, that'll save us. Uh, David, did I see your hand up at all? Or was that something I just... Did you have a question? No. Okay. Um, look, on that particular note, um, we will have you back, Simon. I think uh, it sounds like an episode on its own. Uh, it's timely that we had David from BlackBerry IoT Solutions as well. Uh, BlackBerry is very much involved in this space and, you know, the commercialization of AI as well, particularly with Silent, you know, I've been around with, since Silent. So uh, very interesting in t having you two on together. So on that particular note, I'm going to thank our panelists. Thank you, Simon. Sorry we couldn't uh, have your actual session, I, but that uh, that was my fault. And, and apologies <laughs> to your listeners. I'll be better organised next time. Yeah, apologies. I did. I did mention Max don't like us, so um, we just have to change the platform. <laughs> uh, and David, I appreciate your time. It's great to have BlackBerry uh, back on our channel. And, and I'm going to let you both go. Pleasure. Um, Thanks, Chris. And ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a video. You can hang around if you like. Uh, goes for nine minutes. Uh, there's a lot of Navy uh, exercises going on and we'll hear from uh, Commander Philippa May and then I will close the session. So thank you for episode nine of our Indo-Pacific series. And I should have been clicking through a couple of slides there. Uh, and our, all our episodes are now available on the marketplace also. So here's a brief video from the Australian Navy.
Over the past three months, the Australian Defence Force has embarked on the largest joint maritime-based task group in recent times. The five-ship task group has proceeded through the Southeast Asian and the Pacific region, engaging in exercises and operations to strengthen relations, show commitment to the region and improve our interoperability with regional allies and partners. Over the past three months, the task group has participated in many operations and exercises with our regional allies and partners. Most notably, 